No democracy pretends to be a tyranny. Most tyrannies pretend they are democracies. Democracy remains the definition of political legitimacy. That has not changed, and that will not change. Political legitimacy is necessary even when the common population has no real political power. Augustus knew that. That is why in 27 BC he pretended to retire, so that in being begged not to, his rule could be seen as an acquiescence to popular demand. He gave a speech in front of the Senate in which he was frequently interrupted with shouts pleading for monarchical government. This was his attempt to legitimize his authoritarian rule, an authoritarian rule he obtained as all subsequent emperors would exercise after him. Cassius Dio tells us, by virtue of holding the censorship, they scrutinize our lives and morals. They have been set free from the laws. They are exempted from all binding tradition. In this video, we're gonna discuss what Augustus did to aggrandize and enlarge the Roman state. The strategy of Augustus seems to have been that he thought it was a great advantage to have a large, broad state in which many people could find themselves advantaged through the civil service or the military. Now the two sources I'm using here are Cassius Dio's Reign of Augustus and Suetonius. For the Suetonius I'm using the J.C. Rolf translation. To enable more men to take part in the administration of the state, he devised new offices, the charge of public buildings, of the roads, of the aqueducts, of the channel of the Tiber, of the distribution of grain to the people, as well as the prefecture of the city. He increased the number of praetors. To enable senators' sons to gain an earlier acquaintance with public business, he allowed them to attend meetings of the Senate. And he was on to something, I would think. Because for all the noble families who are of the knightly class or of the senatorial class, they could assume a post and operate with the force of the state behind them. The lore of dictatorial power could well be that when it is distributed, each prong of the state is themselves a dictator of sorts. This is from chapter 13 of book 53 of Cassius Dio. Governors whom the emperor had appointed were to be known as propraetors and to hold office for as much longer than a year as he thought fit. They were also to wear military uniform and carry a sword, with which they have authority to execute even soldiers. And get this, no one else, it should be noted, who is not empowered to put a soldier to death has been granted the right of wearing a sword. So we see the power he had to puff you up. Not only could you be granted full license as a governor, but the mere sight of your sword was a badge, the insignia of full despotic power. All lives you encounter are yours to dispose of. You knew it. They knew it. It must have brought with it a palpable sense of dread to the provincial population and an inflated sense of power to Octavian's appointees. Why would you rebel? against someone who had empowered you like that. I think that's the strategy. All propraetors alike are attended by five lictors. So in addition to that, you get stuff. He makes sure you are attended. The governors um, who were appointed by the emperor himself received this benefit, not the governors who were appointed by the Senate. Octavian also seemed to be particularly conscientious of maintaining the integrity of the classes. So it seems like the classes were, there. they were the senatorial families, knights, and then freed men. Book 53, chapter 15, you may read for yourself if you like. It would seem that praetors and quaestors were posts that required a senatorial rank. Military tribunes came from the knights. Procurators could be knights, but also potentially freedmen. So suffice it to say there was a strict sense of class and a complex set of rules for appointments within the Roman bureaucracy. So we should probably conclude that Augustus balanced the need to distribute power with the need to keep his aristocratic families from acquiring enough power to challenge him. And we see this in various places. I'm not going to quote it because it's boring. Cassius Dio is not a page-turning history. All right, next. 
It's a little amusing, though, to see how class consciousness played out in spectacle. He loved these spectacles. At first, Augustus wanted the aristocratic youths to participate in some of these as runners or charioteers, or other things like boxers, things like that. Apparently, finding it a fit way for the ambitious young man uh, to seek renown and to gain it in a non-political way. We can see a strategy, right? Making sure people can obtain power, wealth, and fame within his society so it doesn't feel like everybody's being kept down. I think one of the things that, one of the mistakes that Alexander the Great made was that he didn't realize a certain number of people within your immediate peer group need to feel like their rank and privilege and wealth and prestige is tethered to your continued rule. A significant number of people should feel like their fortunes are tied to yours. You can't have your whole court think they'd be better off with you dead. If that happens, you die. I think that's what happened to Alexander. So anyway, he liked these games. He gave frequent performances of the game of Troy by older and younger boys, thinking it a time-honored and worthy custom for the flower of the nobility to become known in this way. That's from Suetonius. All right, so a further curiosity are the seating arrangements at these games. This is where class was on full display. This is from, from Suetonius. The Senate decreed that whenever any public show was given anywhere, the first row of seats should be reserved for senators. And at Rome, he would not allow the envoys of the free and allied nations to sit in the orchestra. He separated the soldiery from the people. He assigned special seats to married men of the commons, to boys under age their own section. No one wearing a dark cloak should sit in the middle of the house. What the hell is that about? He would not allow women to view even the gladiators except from the upper seats. Only the Vestal Virgins were assigned a place to themselves opposite the Praetor's Tribunal. We might interpret the restriction of women in any number of ways. It merely could be that these being sporting events... They were a waste of a good seat on account of non-interest. It also could have been that they were second-class citizens, and this reinforced that. It could also be a way to affirm the elevation of chastity by confronting women with the preference given to the Vestal Virgins, and it might also have been that he was actually legitimately afraid that women would be aroused by these gladiators and boxers. Okay. Regarding the spectacle itself, I think Augustus had a genuine interest in it. Suetonius says he was especially given to watching boxers, particularly those of Latin birth, the common untrained townspeople that fought rough and tumble and without skill in the narrow streets. So in the streets of ancient Rome, an amateur boxing match could break out, and it was possible that the emperor himself would show up and watch. When we see Oct um, Octavian dealt with in popular culture, he's usually shown as an aristocratic pseudo sociopath who slept half the time and had no real qualities of his own. He clearly had a complex character. It's hard to get a bead on him from the history. So he only allowed mobility between the classes if there was some compelling reason. As far as the treatment of slaves goes, we have two stories from Cassius Dio which may demonstrate for us the culture of Rome under Augustus. The first is the story of two slaves belonging to the conspirator Fanius Caepio. Now, Caepio conspired against Augustus, and we have no reason to doubt that he was captured as he fled. In Cassius Dio, Book 54, Chapter 3, we get the story. This story deals with Caepio's father and how he dealt with two of his slaves. There were two slaves who had accompanied Caepio in his flight. One of these had wished to defend his young master when he met his death, and this man Caepio's father freed. The second had deserted the young man. Caepio's father had him led through the forum carrying an, ex an inscription to explain the reason why he was to be put to death and later crucified him. The emperor showed no disapproval of either of these actions. Okay, this anecdote serves to show us something about how the Romans viewed slaves and how they viewed the concept of loyalty. So we see here, Caepio's father, after his son, is a proven traitor, right? He's a traitor against the state. And yet his father has the ability to, to take it out on these two slaves. The one defended him to the death or was prepared to. That slave gets freed. And the one who was disloyal gets crucified. This tells you what the Romans thought. Slaves were expected to obey their masters even to the point of open sedition. It is an exotic 
principle to the way we think. The Romans seem to have regarded treachery to be worse than any violation of some other principle. And we see this in the history of the Jewish wars written by Josephus. King Herod had taken Mark Antony's side in the Civil War, but when Herod approached Octavian afterwards, he asked him not to judge him as an enemy, but according to his unceasing loyalty to Antony. Even as an enemy, he entreated Octavian to continue his support, as in Roman support, for Herod's rule. And based on this plea, Herod was forgiven. These are the lines. Herod said this to Octavian, according to Josephus. I have not deserted him upon his defeat at Actium, nor upon the evident change of his fortune. Examine how I behave myself to my benefactors in general, and what sort of friend I am, thou wilt find by experience that we shall do and be the same to thyself. That worked on Octavian. Herod retained the support of Rome for his rule over Judea. The other interesting anecdote reported by Cassius Dio that cuts to Roman culture is uh, Book 54, Chapter 23, pertaining to this guy Vedius Polio. This guy, Vedius Polio, kept in tanks giant eels which had been trained to devour men, and he was in the habit of throwing to them those of his slaves whom he wished to put to death. Once, when he was entertaining Augustus, his cupbearer broke a crystal goblet. Thereupon, Polio, paying no attention to his guest, ordered the slave to be thrown to the eels. And the rest of the story goes that Augustus himself decided to break something, and so his host was forced into the awkward position of not being able to punish the slave. But we can see the decadence of ancient Rome. The story might have been circulated by Augustus, if you really think about it. It sounds like the sort of thing that he would want to circulate, the wisdom of Solomon, so to speak. Next, it is Cassius Dio who tells us that he adopted the title of Augustus as signifying that he was something more than human, since indeed all the most precious and sacred objects are referred to as Augusta. He also put on great festivals. Suetonius writes, festivals and holidays he celebrated lavishly as a rule. But he was also against transparent government. He passed a law that the proceedings of the Senate should not be published. Suetonius tells us this. It would also seem that he was the subject of rumor and misinformation. This line from Cassius Dio may be one of my favorite observations I've come across in some time. This is on the nature of chatter in the public and its contrast with the real machinations of government. Book 53, Chapter 19. Much that never materializes becomes common talk, while much that has undoubtedly come to pass remains unknown. And in pretty well every instance, the report which is spread abroad does not correspond to what actually happened. The stuff we talk about to each other, our speculations, our anticipations, our conspiracy theories, never come to pass, <laughs> never come to pass. And the things that we can see for ourselves, we can't explain. <laughs> the second part of that clause is just as, <laughs> while much that has undoubtedly come to pass remains unknown, things that are indisputably true. We know the least about. It's just, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Do we prefer to babble about a hypothetical future than attempt to explain an observable present? Oh, Cassius Dio, you're a wise man. Let's get it one more time. Much that never materializes becomes common talk, while much that has undoubtedly come to pass remains unknown. You know who he sounds like is the Marquis de Sade. This is from Juliet. You see that men are wont to ascribe a real existence to a good many things which actually have no more than conjectural existence. 